In this video we're going to discuss the concept of electron spin. So in 1922, two physicists named Stern and Gerlach did the following experiment. They had some source which would heat up silver atoms which have a single unpaired electron in their valence shell and then they would be ejected towards a target and if there was no magnetic field on here they would just get one band of these silver atoms but if there was an inhomogeneous magnetic field as they applied the field strength larger and larger they got a splitting of the atoms into two distinct bands there would be no atoms at a zero deflection here and they would either be deflected uh, in a positive or in a negative way so this suggested that this a uh, single unpaired electron at the top of the valence shell has two possible states. Now this is in contradiction to what we've talked about thus far because we've said if we've specified all three quantum numbers, n, l, and m, that we have an unambiguous determination of the exact state of that wave function. Whereas this is saying that there must be another quantum number that we're missing because uh, you wouldn't be able to observe different physical properties for two uh, systems in the same state. So obviously our determination of a, the state from these three quantum numbers is incomplete. So what do we need to do to remedy this? So uh, Wolfgang Pauli introduced the concept of a spin quantum number. So we have thus far n, uh, l, and m sub l and this spin quantum number is going to be called m sub s and it's going to equal plus or minus one half. Now at the time Pauli didn't have a lot of justification for this but later on Dirac proved that there is a good justification like this but for now we're just going to talk about uh, how we use it and what the different operators we have that can act on it are. So and this is again uh, for an electron. This is m sub s can take on plus or minus one half. Okay, so we have some operators that we can use uh, with this quantum number here and some states that we can use to describe it. So we have two spin states and we're going to describe these as the states alpha and beta. As I can put them in kets here. Okay, alpha and beta, again, these kets are Dirac notation, so you can familiar, familiarize yourself with Dirac notation from the video from several, several lectures ago. And we have the spin operators, which are going to be analogous to the operators for um, L and M sub L for total angular momentum and the uh, Z component of angular momentum. These are going to be the S squared the total spin angular momentum and SZ or the Z component of the spin angular momentum. Okay, so what happens when these operators act on these two spin states here? Well, we can have S squared act on alpha and alpha, is, alpha and beta are both eigenfunctions of S squared and just like acting L squared on um, a state with L we get h bar s s plus one as our eigenvalue and then alpha back again. Similarly s squared acting on beta gives us the same value h bar um, I think I believe this is h bar squared yes h bar squared s times s plus one acting on beta where again s is going to be equal to one half. Then we can also have S sub Z acting on alpha and that is going to give one half H bar alpha so one half H bar for the eigenvalue and S sub Z acting on beta is going to give minus one half H bar Beta. So we're gonna we're gonna use these two spin states here and end up tacking them on to our spatial wave functions, the psi NLMs, and we'll be able to describe these two different states uh, as we can see in this magnetic field here. Okay, but then some more analogies we can draw between uh, total angular moment, uh, 
orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum. For orbital angular momentum, its absolute magnitude would be h bar times the square root of l times l plus 1, the orbital angular momentum quantum number. And then for spin angular momentum, drawing the analogy, we'd have h bar times square root of s times s plus 1. It's the square root of the eigenvalue of the s squared operator. This is the square root of the eigenvalue of the l squared operator. Then, uh, just like all wave functions of Hermitian operators have to be, alpha and beta form a orthonormal set. So, the ket alpha alpha, which is the integral over the entire range of alpha of alpha star alpha, that and beta beta, so the integral of beta star beta, those equal one. And the integral of alpha star beta is equal to the integral of beta star alpha, which is equal to zero. So these are orthonormal to each other, they are orthogonal. If they are not the same, they give you zero. And if they and they are normalized, if they are the same, they give you one. Okay, so we could also represent these in kets like this, where alpha you could have in the value one half, one half for s equals one half, s sub z equals one half, and beta you could have the ket s equals one half, s sub z equals minus one half. You might also see this type of representation for the alpha and beta state, just like we can represent nl the wave the wave functions of the hydrogen atom, the psi nlm, as a ket with the three uh, quantum numbers for the hydrogen atom. Then we can say that s squared acting on a ket of s and m sub s is equal to h bar squared s times s plus 1 times the same ket and that s sub z acting on s and m sub, and m sub s is going to be equal to h bar m sub s s m sub s and then those are similarly normalized to orthonormal to each other as we've seen there where we have s m sub s so the bra is s m sub s the ket is s m sub s prime that equals delta m sub s m sub s prime the Kronecker delta for the value of m sub s. Okay, so this changes our total wave functions for our hydrogen atom in the following way. We're going to have psi n l, and now on m we're going to be careful to note that you have m sub l because we're also going to have the quantum number n sub s, so there are four numbers here. And this wave function is a function of r, theta, phi, and sigma, a spin coordinate which is just kind of a dummy coordinate that holds uh, the value of, of spin, whether that's going to be spin up or spin down, alpha or beta. And that's going to be the psi of nl m sub l of r theta and phi that we're used to. And then times the function omega of sigma, the spin coordinate, where omega, again, is going to be either alpha or beta. Okay, so this entire ket here, if we have an entire ket with n, l, m sub l, and m sub s, that would be referred to as a spin orbital. The type of orbital we had previously where we would have had just n, l, and m sub l without spin, that would be referred to as a spatial orbital, so just a function of space whereas a spin orbital is a function of the three spatial coordinates and also the spin coordinate sigma. Okay, so <clears throat> that's going to be uh, how, how that's going to work and this is also going to obey uh, principles of orthonormality if we have n, l, m sub l, m sub s and n prime, l prime m sub l prime m sub s prime 
then this this is integral over all spatial coordinates and over the spin coordinates of the entire wave function. Then that's going to follow the same relation, delta n m prime, delta l l prime, delta m sub l, m sub l prime, delta m sub s, m sub s prime. So if all four quantum numbers are not the same, then this integral is going to be zero because at least one of these deltas will be zero. And if all four are the same, then they're going to be one. All these deltas will be one. And you'll get a total wave function which is normalized. So these are going to form a set of orthonormal orbitals. And this is going to allow us to describe both the spatial uh, function, which are the atomic orbitals, and also the spin function, which is spin up or spin down. And these four quantum numbers give us the complete set of quantum numbers that we can use to describe uh, any electron in any atomic orbital for any hydrogen-like atom.